welcome to Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here, along with science advisor Matt Moniz. The silent assassin Matt Costa is in the studio. He's here, but he's he's not sticking around because uh, he's got to spring forward a little bit earlier than the rest of us tomorrow. So, Matt, you're gonna uh, you're gonna be here bright and early tomorrow morning. That's the deal. Uh, I'm gonna be here. I'm gonna be bright-eyed, uh, probably not bushy-tailed, but right. Yeah, your tail's looking a little uh, sad these days. It is. It is. Need some keratin <laughs> in your diet. <laughs> Something more pectin. Need to uh, some do some squats. So, but uh, you'll be here for the special broadcast uh, with with the the Fun 107, 107 walk. Uh, yep, they're doing a walk Taylor. at. Um, I thought it was at uh, UMass Dartmouth. Oh, okay. Um, it used to be. A I could be wrong. Uh, I, I could be wrong. Know. I'm. <laughs> There's a big book of things around here that we're supposed to promote. You think I would look at that once oh, in a while? Well, that's and then I would know. That's FM stuff. Uh, that's that's yeah. when it's that's when it's Tim Weisberg Saturday morning general talk show host time. This is Spooky South Coast time, where we talk about the paranormal, which is what we do each and every Saturday night. And I know that uh, last week's show is still generating a lot of buzz. Of course, we had Nick Roth and Katrina Weidman on from Paranormal Lockdown. But a lot of people, Matt, have been talking to me and, and over the course of the week and asking me about Ghost Heads, the, the Ghostbusters fan documentary, the documentary about the Ghostbusters fans that's that's uh, coming out soon. Right, right. It's um, I'm, We had uh, Lee LaShawn on uh, last week, and he was promoting his um, a movie that he produced uh, about basically um, Ghostbuster fans. So and uh, you know I'm not I'm not trying to suck you in here and getting you to stay even though it's okay I'm 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 trying to look up to see if they raised their money because I know that they were close they were very close that they were really close and and I know that a lot of people were saying they were going to go and make a donation so hopefully uh, they they did reach it but one of the other documentaries that uh, is coming out that I'm very <clears throat> keen to to find out about and uh, we're actually going to bring on one of our co-hosts for tonight Chris Balzano the show's content director good evening Chris how are you. Good evening. How are you tonight? Oh, we are spooktacular. You know that. But cool. uh, speaking of documentaries, uh, the HBO doc produced documentary on Slenderman premiered, uh, I think it was last night at the uh, South by Southwest Festival. Yeah, I'm really excited to see it. Um, actually, thinking about getting HBO Go <laughs> just so I can uh, watch it. Anyone who knows me knows that that's like been my obsession for a few years now, so I'm very interested to see their, uh, their take on it. Although, from what I understand, it's much more the true crime aspect than the sociological aspect of it, so I'm, uh, I'm hoping to still be able to bring that as that, uh, that part of it to people. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I tried finding some of my HBO contacts to see if uh, anybody over there can help us hook us up with any kind of interview. I'm sure it'll be a matter of when it gets closer to air, because they, they was it that they produce it or they purchase the rights to it? Uh, HBO? Yeah. They produced, uh, no, they pr- uh, bought the rights to it. Okay, so even before it premiered, HBO had, uh, had already heard the buzz around it and said, you know what, we're going to buy this up now and make sure that we can air this. Right. That's that's my understanding of it. I actually posted an article about it today. If you uh, either check the uh, the Twitter or the, um, or the Facebook. Well, I, either way, it's a topic that we're definitely going to tackle because it's one of those things that has been... Uh, you know, it, we've seen urban legends grow over time, but this one is one of the fastest growing ever. And and the funny thing about this is the person who created the whole story has come out and said, I made it all up, but it doesn't matter. Um, no, it doesn't matter at all. I mean, we could do an entire show just even not even talking about the, the court case itself and just talking about the, the origins of Slender Man and, and kind of the evolution and why it works so much. Um, but, you know, I don't necessarily think that, that he... Um, you know, I know you're very, very much into uh, can we create something just by thinking about it, and can we um, um, can we create the paranormal? It's not that he just has tapped into something that's been in cultures for thousands of years. Yeah, and and really, what's what it is is it's just a, a different way for people to spread that story instead of sitting around a campfire or going from town to town and telling the story while pushing their you know cart full of odds, odds and ends. They're just getting together on the, on the internet and sharing the story. Right, and, and you know, really, it's it's. If you look back to, um, I mean, I I did a lot of time searching, even like old uh, folk stories and fairy tales and little kids stories, and going back to the like original Grimm brothers um, texts of things, you can see all those elements, which means either a we've been scared about this stuff for a real long time, or we were scared about it because it really exists. Hmm. 
And it were real genuine fears people, parents were trying to protect people from. I think that uh, that particular night when we do that show, we will definitely have the lights on here in the studio. And, uh, <laughs> and I, you know what? That'll be a good show to do on one of those primetime episodes that we do like at 6 o'clock at night because the Red Sox are on later. So that when I go home, it's still light out. Yeah, yeah. It's a, well, you, you'll be okay, Eric. You're not a kid, so you'll be all set. Well, he really just he really just wants to the kids and the teenagers. So yeah. I, I think I think we are both too old. I hope so. No, it doesn't bode well for our children, but you know, as long as we're okay, right? That's all that matters. So well, if that wasn't a born segue, too. Well, and, and we are going to talk about kids tonight, too. <laughs> and we're going to talk with our guest tonight coming up in just a bit, Katrina Jane. She is a, she's a psychic medium. Uh, she's from Australia. And she's going to be joining us all the way from, from Sydney to, uh, to talk to us about her new book. It's, it's called Do, Do You See What I See? That's the name of it, right, Chris? Mm-hmm. Don't want to get it wrong and reverse anything there, but it's it's basically it's a children's book that helps children understand if they have these abilities, how and and what they mean, and it, and it gives it to them in an easy to digest manner. So that means that tonight we're going to be talking about indigo children. We're going to be talking about clairvoyance. I'm really interested in finding out about her journey with another book she wrote about her journey from being. Uh, somebody who is Christian to being somebody who is clairvoyant. So, uh, and that's actually always fascinating. And that's the title of one of her books, Christian to Clairvoyant. But I want to talk about that. But we're also going to talk about indigo children, crystal children. We're going to find out about this phenomena that's taking over, and 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 find out if there is something different about these times that are bringing up these children, or if it's something that has been ongoing and we're just finally paying attention to it. And the odd thing is, is that. Um uh, black-eyed children as well have really come out of kind of a paranormal shadow um, where it's starting to appear on a lot more news feeds uh, that don't traditionally talk about the paranormal or it's not a paranormal, it's not an examine.com that's a paranormal blog or something like that. These are news reports coming out and uh, and folklorists now studying it pretty hardcore. So it, so it, is a, it seems to be a time of the children. I, I am definitely looking forward to tonight. Maybe you let the kids stay up if uh, if you don't usually let them stay up and listen to it, or maybe you just want to send them to bed because you're a little bit worried they might be <laughs> they might have some problems that you don't want to deal with right now. So uh, maybe we'll, we'll change the bumper music to uh, Whitney Houston. Yeah, well, we believe the children are the future. And speaking of children and segues, here's a great <laughs> chance to feel like a kid again at the upcoming <laughs> Legend Trips event happening May 21st. Riding the haunted rails of Edaville Railroad. I really should like just. I should just retire now as the master of segways. It is. It, it, you've got it. You've won it tonight. But uh, the, the the event is coming up on May twenty first. Tickets are ninety nine dollars. It's already more than halfway sold out. And this isn't like a twenty or thirty person event. We had a good amount of tickets for sale for this. It's already more than halfway sold out. We're talking about maybe having to open even more tickets for this event because it's selling so fast and because there is so much space at, at Edaville. But people that, I mean, you know, normally we see the Legend Trips regulars. They're the first ones to buy the tickets. We're getting people from all over New England and, and kind of all over the country that I've never even seen come to one of our events because people remember Edaville from when they were children and they want to come and check this place out and, and they want to come and go behind the scenes and see the inner workings of Edaville while looking for some of the spirits there. So... If you wanted to get tickets for this event, I highly recommend doing it uh, that you that you get your tickets now just in case you know we're not able to add some more, just in case they start to sell out even faster. A lot of people have told me that they're going to be buying tickets and, and just haven't yet. So make sure that you jump on board, no pun intended, if you want to. And you know what? Jeff and I talked about this because it costs a little bit extra to get the train. As part of this, you know, we did it last time. We got the train tour as part of the uh, event, but it costs extra. And we're like, well, let's see how the ticket sales go. I think we're going to be definitely able to swing the train for this one. Uh, so you get the chance to see Edaville by the rail and you get the history, the haunted history of Edaville well, as we go around the park. And then when you get off, it's time to go and look for ghosts. So it should be a great night. Legendtrips.com is the website if you want to get tickets. And also sign up for the mailing list at Legend Trips because even though we have this Edaville event for sale, we have another little smaller, very intimate 20-person event at a historic location here in New England that's going to be coming up soon. We haven't announced the details yet. We haven't announced it for pre-sale yet. If you go to legendtrips.com right now and sign up for the mailing list, when we do announce it, you'll get first crack at the tickets. 
And because there's only going to be 20 tickets for this event on sale, you'll probably lose out if you don't have the chance to buy them during pre-sale. So absolutely sign up for that mailing list tonight or as soon as you are hearing my voice via podcast because you are going to want to make sure that you get on board for this one. Now that takes care of the promotional aspect of it. So all the people on Twitter that like to complain that the show has become nothing but commercials for Legend Trips, that part of the show is over. And we are going to move forward with the discussion. Coming up in just a few moments, we'll take a break. And we'll be joined by Katrina Jane. Katrina Jane. On the other side, I'm going to keep messing that up all night tonight. I have mush mouth. And uh, we'll talk with her about all these different things. And, of course, the phone lines will be open throughout the course of the show. 508-996-0500. 877-996-1420. If you would like to call in, you can also text us using the number 67664. You just have to start your text with the letters WBSM so it filters into us. So just put it in your phone right now in your text message app, whatever you use, and type in in the number to send it to, 67664, and then start it with WBSM. And you can text us during the show. You can also reach out to us on Twitter, at SpookySC, or just comment using the hashtag SpookyLive. And email as well, SpookyCrew at SpookySouthCoast.com is another way to get a hold of us. But just want to let everybody know that tonight we're going to be talking with Katrina Jane, and she is a clairvoyant. She is a psychic medium. We are not talking with her. We're not getting readings from her tonight. This is going to be about exploring her life, her gifts, and talking with her about these indigo children, about these crystal children, and about what this means for future generations and also how to talk to your kids if you think that they have these gifts or these abilities so we'll be covering all of that tonight and uh, so keep that in mind during your phone calls so that nobody's calling in being like um can you tell me if my grandfather is with me because normally you know we usually do that with psychics and mediums but tonight is a, a, a special case and she's calling all the way from australia so we don't want to have to have her sit on the phone and give readings all night. We wanted to be able to talk about herself. So, Chris, uh, when when uh, we were setting everything up, did you figure out exactly what time it's going to be for her over there? I think she said it's going to be... I'm trying to think of what the time she said. I think she said it's maybe 10 o'clock in the morning. So that's not too bad. I don't feel so bad about that. No, no, 10 it's 10 o'clock not in the like... morning, Monday, though, right? Yeah. I mean, it's. I, I, it might actually, Sunday, it might actually be... Today's Saturday. Yeah. It might be December there. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> right now it's Christmas and we're ruining it. <laughs> but uh, so, no, yeah, I, so make sure to make sure to say you know Happy St. Patrick's Day to her. I guess. Right, yeah, I, to I have a sister-in-law that's living in Australia right now, and, and it's always crazy when we're trying to call her because like I can never figure out. I, I think it's something like sixteen hours ahead, but I can never really be too sure. Yeah, I'm not a really good math person. Nope. So even if you said that, I wouldn't be able to figure out when we were. And uh, and one final note to let everybody know before we uh, take a break. I was supposed to get my ghost arc yesterday. Like, it's shipped. I got the DHL confirmation that it was being shipped like a a month ago. And they had never actually brought the package to DHL. Well, they brought it the other day. They brought it on, like, Wednesday? And the estimated delivery was Friday. And it was coming from Italy. So I was like, well, that's pretty fast turnaround. I don't know if that's going to happen. But it kept saying, estimated Friday delivery, and it was in New York at JFK on Friday morning. So I was like, oh, they're going to just put it on the truck and drive it to my house. Uh, Apparently, no. It has to go to Pawtucket to another sorting facility before it comes to me. So supposedly it's coming Monday. So on Monday when I receive my ghost arc, if I get it on Monday, like I should, I will be, uh, I'm going to actually try and jump on uh, Periscope and Periscope out unboxing the ghost arc, turning it on for the first time, all of that stuff, I will do live as it's happening. So you'll see what, what happens as soon as I as soon as I see it. So uh, definitely worth following me on Twitter at Tim Weisberg for that. And uh, I think I, can you Periscope out of multiple accounts yet? Do you know Matt? I know you can hook the GoPro up now for Periscope. Right, right. So I'll probably and try that. You can that is linked to your Twitter as well, right? Yeah, it's linked to my Twitter. I just don't know if you can link it to multiple Twitters yet. But either way, we'll send the link out, and you'll be able to see it. Everybody will be able to see it when we do it, because it's, you know we're going to open it up, turn it on, see how it all works, give our impressions, and then we'll find a place to take it out and try it out on a test run. I have uh, a line on something that's going to be coming up uh, in April 
monies that I'll tell you about off the air. Very okay. exciting. Very exciting. It'll eventually lead to something for the public as well, but for right now, it's very hush-hush. So I don't want to give away too much next. Uh, but uh, we're all right, so we're going to take a break. When we come back on the other side, we'll be joined by Katrina Jane all the way from Sydney, Australia. And uh, we will talk with her for the remainder of the show. And thank you all for tuning in. Again, if you are new to the show, we podcast every episode for the last 10 years. Or they're all available for you on SpookySouthCoast.com. So if you are a first-time listener, I know that you know we get a lot of first-time listeners who are fans of Katrina Jane who are tuning in for the first time. If you like what you hear, 10 years of archives. All free. Can't go wrong. Start downloading them during the commercial. We'll be back in just a moment with more Spooky South Coast here on New Bedford's News Talk Station, 1420 WBSM. About Chamonix for years now, but do you know how it all began? A lady asked a pharmacist named George to recommend a natural preservative free wrinkle cream. He could have told her that no such product existed. Instead, he mixed her a formula right there in the pharmacy. A few weeks later, there was a waiting list for what the ladies affectionately called George's Cream, and Chamonix was born. George built Chamonix into a world class anti aging skincare brand based on the same philosophy he had in the small pharmacy. Chamonix Chamonix products are infused with antioxidants. Use no pharmaceutical preservatives or petroleum byproducts. Best of all, I use this and I love it. Order Chamonix's revolutionary eye bag and puffiness treatment, GenuCell, right now, and George will double your order absolutely free. Call 800-663-2904. 800-663-2904. Results guaranteed or your money back. Call 800-663-2904. 800-663-2904. Bedford's News Talk Station, 1420 WBSM. Saturdays at 2, WBSM Talks. Money. Money. Money matters with Jose Matos. Call in to find out if you're saving enough for retirement and how to get yourself on the right track. Jose's the money man with your money plan. From Advanced Financial Group, money matters can change your quality of life after you retire. But it all starts now. Saturdays at 3 on 1420 WBSM. I'm Nick Soboleski, a select quote agent with a true story that could save you hundreds of dollars a year. A woman named Linda just called. Her husband, Ray, has a $300,000 group life insurance policy, but is changing jobs and can't take it with him. Well, I impartially shot the highly rated term life insurance companies we represent and found Ray, who is 41 and takes medication to control his cholesterol, a 10-year, $500,000 policy for under $26 a month. That's almost twice the coverage for less than half of what he had paid. If SelectQuote hasn't shot for your life insurance, you're probably paying too much. For your free quote, call 1-800-597-4816. That's 1-800-597-4816. 1-800-597-4816. Or go to selectquote.com. We shop, you save. Get full details on the example policy at selectquote.com slash commercials. Your price can vary depending on your health issuing company and other factors not available in all states. A promise was made. A promise that hit the beaches of Normandy. A vow that captured Iwo Jima. A contract that weathered Tet. A pledge that stormed the desert in Iraq. An IOU that braved IEDs in Kandahar. A promise was made to America's veterans. DAV fights to keep that promise, so all veterans and their families get the benefits and support they earn. For help, visit DAV.org. This world is filled with evil and chaos. Are you longing for peace and contentment? Only our Heavenly Father can bestow hope and a contented heart. Study His Word, the Bible, with People's Christian Church, New Bedford. Pastor Ardeth Bednars welcomes you to our Sunday Happy Bible Hour, 7 a.m. here on 1420 WBSM. You are part of God's divine plan. Join us for understanding, wisdom, and truth. If you can't see the difference, why pay the difference? 
Switch to DISH and see what real value is. Call 877-319-6988. You can also save a bundle when you combine DishNet high-speed internet with your TV service. Call 877-319-6988. Programming starting as little as $29.99, plus access to thousands of movies and TV shows. Stream to your TV, smartphone, or tablet. Call 877-319-6988. Say goodbye to the cable guy and get DISH today. And welcome back to Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here, along with science advisor Matt Moniz. And the silent assassin, Matt Coss, is still here. He's, he's hanging out for a little bit, but uh, you know we're going to let him spring forward a little bit earlier, and, and we're going to spring him from the studio in just a little bit. But uh, And, of course, Chris Balzano co-hosting with us tonight as well. And now joining us on the line, we have tonight's guest. Uh, we were able to pull, pull this all together via Skype. It's always amazing when we can get the technology to work. That's what uh, I always find to be the most fascinating part. But joining us now, we have clairvoyant medium author and a member of the International Psychic Association joining us all the way from Australia. We have Katrina Jean. Good evening. How are you, Katrina? I am well. Should I say good day, mate? How are you? <laughs> <laughs> That's perfectly fine with me. I, I Listen. <laughs> I love the accent, and I love uh, I love all things Australia. So just uh, make sure that uh, you, you know while we're talking, if we start to sound too Bostony, let us know. We try not to sound too Boston. <laughs> Even My Chris, who no longer lives in Boston, will sound Bostony. <laughs> My husband and I were I in am? the states a few years ago, and you do, when you have your own accent, you actually don't realise how strong the Australian accent is until you're amongst all these Americans and you hear an Australian talk, and you just fling around and go, "Oh my goodness, do we sound like that?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how we feel when we watch movies about Boston and we realize, no, wait, we don't sound like that. People just do terrible Boston accents in movies. <laughs> Even people that are from Boston put on these overly done accents in Boston movies. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so, I mean, that must, how, that must be how you feel about Crocodile Dundee. You're like, oh, stop it, Paul Hogan. It's too much. Yes, it is. It's, it becomes that whole, yeah, really over-the-top you know, um, accent that, that Australians have. And, and I suppose it's no different to, to you guys there in the States, but within Australia, people have different accents. Yeah, I was going to say, you sound, you, you remind me more of Flight of the Concord, so I'm saying it's more of New Zealand than Yes, Australia. okay. Yes, okay. Yeah, I'll take it. That's all right. New Zealand's well, an old she, case. <laughs> she, just had, she just had the reaction when someone from, like, Florida, where I am, says that I have a New York accent, and I'm like, no, <laughs> no way, no way. That should be more like Canadian. So. No, you know, that you sound like Canadian. Like, it's a different country, so it's like Canadian accent. <laughs> I just wanted to drop in a Flight of the Concords reference, that's all. I know that was <laughs> you, you know, that was a lovely segue. You did that very well. Uh, Master uh, the segue and the poll tonight. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so uh, obviously, you know, there's a lot that we can cover with you, a lot that we can talk about tonight, and uh, and of course, your new book uh, is one that is very special because this is something that is different than some of your other work, and, and I'm sure that a lot of your work as a clairvoyant medium is done mostly with adults. You probably don't do a lot of work directly with children, uh, but children are kind of the forgotten aspect of this because they are the ones that have the most questions when, when they start to realize that they might be a little bit different than everybody else. Yeah, absolutely. And children are just so open to it, whereas adults sit there and will question everything that might happen to them that's slightly spooky, whereas kids just accept that that's just the way it is until it's pointed out to them that other people aren't seeing the same things that they are. And it, it is a book that was written um, you know, for those children that have you know, the imaginary friend that that people, you know, parents go, oh, they've got this little imaginary friend. And I say to people, you know that's not imaginary. They actually see spirits. And until, you know, adults turn around and go, oh, that's not real or, you know, that's not right, that's when they, you know, they just keep doing it. Yeah, and that's, keep seeing them. that's the way that I always felt, uh, you know, that we put that block into ourselves and that makes it so that we can't, you know, we, we kind of lose any ability that we have to see that. But, you know, I, I've seen plenty of kids walk around talking to imaginary friends that are just such... I mean, Chris and I, you know, we're writers too, uh, and, and we can tell you that we can't craft characters in, in fiction as well-crafted as, as a four- or five-year-old can come up with for an imaginary friend. So there has to be something more to it than just their imagination. Absolutely. And, and some of the things that, you know, the stories that, that children can come out with about these imaginary friends, you, they couldn't think it up. No. You know, like, because, they, they, you know, you'll hear stories of children who've got this imaginary friend who, you know, was from the 1800s and oh, they used to go down in the mines and they used to, and you're thinking, how could, like, a three-year-old know that? 
Right, or or some of these, uh, you know, the past life children now that we see a lot of, that there's no way they could give you such accurate information about World War II, but yet they can because uh, apparently they were there. That's right. And I think that is absolutely fascinating, all that past life stuff that comes through for children. I've known a lady who said she was driving along in her car and her child was in the back seat, you know, probably about three or four, and said, oh, that's the house I used to live in when I was an old man. (laughs) (laughs) And it just, you know, and for the parents, that obviously just freaks them right out because it's like, oh, my God, what's going on? Well, we have a... It's one of those things where... Um, the way that the lines are said so innocently and so, like, succinctly. I, I remember another one that was, I remember when I used to be the daddy and you were the kid. Um, yes. And it's just so innocent and so pure and so, like, to the fact and matter-of-factly that, you know, it, it has that eerie feel to it that just sounds like certainty. I, I yes. can tell you that there is one, uh, there's one local listener here, and I'm, she's probably listening right now, who her son is, they believe, a reincarnated World War II pilot. And yeah. uh, and we keep trying to get her to come on and, and share the story, and, and eventually we'll break her down and get her to come in. Uh, and, and because really, it's it's you know it's just a fascinating story, but to them it's kind of become, you know, that's just how it is. That's just what's going on. But uh, I think everybody would really be fascinated by that. But anyway, so Katrina Jane is our guest tonight, and she has a new book out that is written specifically for children, Do You See What I See? How did it come about, Katrina, to put together a book for children? It came about from people contacting me either through my email, through my website or through my Facebook page, you know, parents or grandparents going, you know, my four-year-old is freaking out at night. They're saying they see these people and how do I explain it to them? What do I say? And that's when I realised there actually wasn't a lot out there to help, you know, the, the carers of these little little children to explain what it is and to not be scared about it. And and that's literally how it started is... um. You know, I I just went, okay, there obviously is a need for this because when a parent has never gone through that and and don't understand it a lot themselves and maybe are are a bit fearful about all the spooky stuff, as I call it, they don't know how to put it into words. I mean, it's something that you went through yourself, I assume, uh, growing up that you probably, uh, at some point this happened to you and at some point you didn't realize what was going on. Absolutely. You just, I was one of those ones with imaginary friends. Oh. And, yeah, and, you know, and so for me, it was just a natural sort of thing. For me, it's easier to explain what goes on because it's happened to me all my life. So when, when yeah. you, I mean, how did it come about for you? How did it happen that you suddenly realized that something was different? It's actually quite interesting. I was actually brought up a very strict Seventh-day Adventist. I don't know if you know a lot about the Seventh-day Adventist religion, but it is it was very, very strict, you know, um, no music, no TV, no going to the pictures, no alcohol, no smoking, nothing like that. A, a very restrictive and enclave kind of thing you only associate with other Seventh-day Adventists. So for me, I never realised I was actually clairvoyant. It was, you know, I just, these things that had happened to me as a child, I just sort of put it under the radar. And then a friend of mine, who's right into all the spooky stuff, said, oh, let's go see a clairvoyant. And I was a little bit freaky about that because that's all the devil's work, you know, um, mm. as, as I'd been brought up. And this woman actually said to me, you know you're clairvoyant. And I said, no, 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 don't be silly. And she says, no, 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 you are. And then she proceeded to ask me like about 10 questions about herself from when she was younger and all that sort of thing. And she said, just answer with the first thing that comes to you. And I got all the questions right. Wow. And that really freaked me out. And she said, okay, what you need to start doing is do this and this and this. And so off I went and and learnt more about it, got a better understanding of, you know, what you can and can't do and how it all works. And then I had some really freaky, spooky stuff happen to me, guys, and which absolutely freaked me out completely. Um, And I went, oh, my goodness, this this is real. Well, you know, we have to ask, what kind of spooky stuff happened to you? (laughs) I had well. I'll give you give you two two stories. Is, is the first one is um, I had this really really vivid dream, and we w- I woke up in the morning and I said to my husband, "Oh my God!" I said, "I just dreamt that you're going to die." And I said to him, "I saw you driving your car. You're on this this road, this country road, and a truck was coming the other way, and it veered onto the wrong side of the road, and you were hit and killed instantly." And he was just like, "Oh, that's a bit freaky," because he was about to head off on a country road. You know, had to go away for work. And I didn't think any more of it. And about midday, he called me on the phone and he goes, 
you and your you know damn dreams and I, I went what what happened and he said well because of what you said I've actually sat like 10 20 kilometers under the speed limit and he said I just witnessed a truck cross over and like hit the car about three cars in front wow wow and so yeah and that actually and I was just like oh my goodness and then another one that happened is again they seem to visit me when my husband's not home may I say all these spooks um hubby was away and um I was actually in bed and all of a sudden, this pressure pushed me down onto the bed flat. I couldn't move. I couldn't open my eyes. I couldn't speak. And then for me, it felt like the bed was rocking, like I was on a really rough ocean. And it just wouldn't stop. And I was just, I have to admit, I was sort of starting to get a little bit concerned about this. Because I'm thinking, well, what are they doing and, and what am I supposed to do? And my religious upbringing kicked in, I must say. And all I could do in my head to try and clear my head was just say the Lord's Prayer of all things. Mm-hmm. And then it, and then it stopped. Well, I mean, I, I guess it makes sense that if something is, you know, you would, you would kind of have that extra perception of what is there. So you would know if it's something that you need to be afraid of and be defensive against as opposed to being just a regular, you know, average spirit that might be hanging around. You would know that it's fight or flight situation. So I'm not surprised that, you know, that type of instinct would kick in. Mm, yeah. And, and you're right. Yeah, you do sort of, I have people again, you know, will contact me and go, I've got this, you know, spook in my house and I'll go, no, it's all right. Just a friendly one. Just popping in to say hello. Or other times I'll go, no, I think you need to go and have a proper house clearing. I, I don't like the energies of that one. So then you find out at a young age that you have these uh, abilities. How do you go about then uh, reaching to the point where you start sharing them with the public? Because I know that's always a tough thing for people is to determine when do I feel uh, confident enough in my abilities to be able to use it now to help other people. And I was also wondering if there was a different stigma attached to it in Australia as there is to America in terms of people who have psychic abilities or believe they have psychic abilities. Good point. I'm sure in regards to the second question, yeah, you know, you always get the skeptics, you'll get the people that rip you to pieces, um, you know, the unbelievers and all that sort of thing. And, And I just don't let them bother me. You know, if they start making comments on my Facebook page, it's just delete and ban. I don't even bother getting into discussion with them some people just aren't open-minded and that's okay that's the way they are but there is that sort of stigma about it so I'm I'm not one of those people who walk up and go hey I'm Katrina and I'm a clairvoyant you know (laughs) you know I wait until somebody says what do you actually do for a living I'll go oh I'm a clairvoyant you know and then they go oh okay and some people go oh my god what can you tell me about me and (laughs) others are a little bit sort of standoffish about it so you just I just you know leave it at that and if they want to do more discuss it more that's fine um, in regards to my, my own abilities, you know, I started going to um, a local spiritualist church. Um, I started to uh, do meditations and doing things like um, psychometry. Do you guys know what psychometry is? Mm-hmm. It's well, when, yeah, when you, you read an object. Yeah, when you, the energy is off an object. So you started doing those sorts of things. And, you know, when people come up and go, oh, my goodness, that was just so so amazing. You were so on the ball with that. You go, oh, okay, okay. And... I am very lucky that I have an amazing husband who, after doing this for about a year and starting to sort of just do little readings for people, but not in a real super professional kind of sense, he just turned around one day and went, no, look, you are meant to be this. This is who you are. Just go and do it. And, you know, I basically went and got my business number, got a business name and put a thing on the the door. And then I had... um, a, a really good story of how it all falls into place, and I do believe everything happens happens for a reason, whether it's good or bad. My cousin was getting married in England, and we'd planned to go over for her wedding. And about three or four weeks prior to that, I was interviewed by our local newspaper for their weekend pull-out magazine. And each week, Chris would buy, that's my husband, Chris would buy the, the paper and go, oh, it's not in there yet, it's not in there yet. And I went, look, don't stress about it. It will go into the paper when it's meant to go into the paper. Anyway, um, I had to go to hospital um, quite – it was a bit of an emergency kind of thing, and so I had to cancel the trip to England. And it was when William and Kate got married, you know, Prince William? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. William and Kate got married that weekend, so the Friday night they got married, and then that Sunday that paper had my article in it. It was like the biggest selling paper of the year <laughs> because of the wedding. I know, and I'm in hospital, zonked out of my head with a general anaesthetic, taking book. That just like really pushed it forward, and I said to my husband, "I'd see it came out." And, but you know, if I hadn't been in hospital, I would have been in England, and I would have missed all of that. Yeah. So see, it definitely mm-hmm. shows that it was 
all kind of tied together and supposed to come together at that time. Uh, when you started, though, pursuing this avenue, you know, coming from your background, and, and you wrote a whole book about it, but coming from your background, what was the feeling of your family, you know, being raised Seventh-day Adventist, and now suddenly you're talking about all this woo-woo stuff? Woo, yeah, woo-woo stuff, all right. Well, most of my family don't talk about it. My family are all still very strict Seventh-day Adventists. My mother, bless her cotton pick and socks, tells people that I'm a counsellor. <laughs> Which is, no, it's true. It is Gotta love euphemism. Yeah, yeah, I'll go, okay, that, that's fine. Um, my stepfather, who is incredibly strict with religion, um, I finally told him only about two years ago uh, what I do, and he basically just tells people I do witchcraft. Hmm. And so he's just anti it completely. So I was going to say, know. but with a, with a negative connotation, I assume. Yes, with yeah. the very negative connotation. It's like such a shame Katrina's into witchcraft. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, it's not, but anyway. <laughs> Well, it, I mean, I can understand, though, from, from coming from, from that background and from having that strict sensibility that all of this stuff kind of goes against God. I can understand having that mindset going into it, but then seeing if they've seen what the work is that you do and they've seen how it affects people and how it helps people, they have to think that this is, you know, if you believe in God, it, this has to be a version of God working through you. You'd like to think so. <laughs> yeah. I thought you really would like to think that's the way it works, but it doesn't because they will pick out bits of the Bible that suit themselves. Hmm. And, and that's how a lot of the, you know, all the religions – don't you find it interesting that there are so many religions, they all base themselves on the one Bible, but they've all got different beliefs? Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. And, and everybody tweaks it to their own purposes. And... Absolutely. You know, and it's like when people throw, it's really funny um, on my Facebook page, people go, oh, you know, you're the spawn of Satan because, you know, you're a clairvoyant and it says in Leviticus, you know, whatever it is, you know, thou shalt not consult with mediums or something. I said, it also says in Leviticus 18.22, you shouldn't be wearing clothing of mixed fibre. So I hope you have not got a cotton poly blend, <laughs> you know, because, <laughs> you know, but they, they, they quite happily ignore those bits. See, you should at least be thankful that you're Australian in this sense, because in America we have a holiday called Thanksgiving, and I have a feeling yours would be very awkward. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it would. We've, we've all but we've all had that awkward Thanksgiving. Yours, yours would definitely be every year. So now, when you are now out there and sharing this gift, and people are coming to you, and obviously, you know, you get that attention from the newspaper story. How do you deal then with having to? I, I'm assuming that you have to have a way to turn this ability off just for your own sanity so that you have some time where it's not all coming at you. How do you become basically a professional clairvoyant where you can make that your profession and then also have a private life away from it? Yeah, absolutely. Good question. I, I do, like I'll say to people, I tune in or turn on when I'm about to do my readings. And then once it's done, I just say to like my spirit guides and that, just turn it off. Don't want to hear anymore. And then I and then I'll just like walk away because I thought you would go absolutely mental walking around the streets or a shopping center and just be getting bombarded with messages from dead people. Mm. You know, you, you just couldn't function like that. So I, I do just turn off and I say to people, I'm just like you are. I just do something slightly different as as a job. And, and and that's really where I think a lot of people have the problem is is not realizing when to carve out, and how to carve out time for themselves once they do have accept that they have this gift and start to practice it. They don't know where to turn it on and turn it off, and that's when it can can become overwhelming. But like anything, you know, you have to have your time away from it, or else it if it becomes all in, all consuming, you eventually learn to to uh, you know to have ill feelings toward it. Absolutely, and you know everybody has to have boundaries in any job. You've got to be able to turn off from whatever you do for a living. But one of my things, and when I do workshops for people to help them develop their own abilities, one of my things that I'm very particular about is I said, you never, ever, ever walk up to a stranger and offer them a message. I, 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 I'm anti that completely. I said, one is an invasion of their privacy. They might not want to hear from the person that is wanting to give them a message. You know, and and I say to people, if somebody comes to me for a reading, well, they're fair game. I just give them whatever comes through. Yeah. But I, I, I just strongly disagree. You know, walking up to some stranger going, I have a message from your dead father. <laughs> you know, like they might have had a terrible childhood that you don't know about. 
and the last person they want to hear from is their father because they hate him. Well, you just you just uh, poo pooed all over a whole TV series here in America that relies <laughs> on that. But so, but now you say you'll when they come to you for a reading though, you'll tell them anything. I mean. Yep. There's no limits. There's no filter. There's no. You've never had a moment where you've said, "I I don't know if I want to share this with the person." What's being said? I I I do filter it, but I'll always give it in a way that might sort of pre-warn them. I'll say to people, "Look, I hope this isn't offensive to you, or I hope you don't get upset about you know data." So they're getting prepared for what might be said. You, you don't tell people when they're going to die, even if you get that message. That is completely unethical. And, um, but, you know, I, I do, I, I always deliver everything, but there's a right way of saying something and there's a wrong way. Like I'm not blunt and just spit things out at them. Well, I think we can certainly, I mean, we're going to be taking a break in a moment here for the news. When we come back on the other side in the next hour, I want to get more in depth on the idea of indigo children, crystal children, you know, what you're writing about in this new book and, and helping kids to understand. And I, we'll get into all of that. And I also want to get into a little bit about how your gift works for you, because that's one question that I always ask every time we have somebody on that has abilities. I want to know what the process is, how it comes to you, how it happens. So we'll get into all of that coming up in the next hour as well. Uh, but one of the, the real kind of shaky questions that I've always encountered with, with people who have abilities is medical issues. When, when they're being told somebody has a medical issue and they should get something checked out, has that ever come up in your readings where you've had to give somebody kind of a nudge to go to the doctor because you've been getting some sort of medical-related information? Absolutely, a lot of times. And, and you, yeah. you'll just tell them that? Yeah, absolutely. But I will say to them, look, you've got an issue in, I feel like there's an issue in this particular area. I, I urge you to go to your doctor and get, a che get it checked out. I, I, I will ne I'll never sort of um, give people medical advice, but I will tell them to go and see a specialist or to go and see their GP or, you know, in, in that line of thing, just so that they're aware of it. Because sometimes, you know, the, the mediums will say it's not my job to dispense medical advice because, you know, the, it's not like you, you go there and the doctor's telling you, I think your grandmother's around you. So, you know, it's yep. it's, it's understandable, but, uh, you know. Oh, absolutely. And like I said, I won't give medical advice. I won't say what you need to do is blah, 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 blah. What I will say is, look, I, I think there's, I'm just feeling this pain sort of around my kidney. So just go and get a check out with, you, with your doctor. Next time you go there, just, just mention that area, you know, and that's, and I'll leave it at that and then it's up to them to do whatever they want with it. And I think, uh, I'm no psychic, but I think Chris is making some fried eggs or something over there. Was that, <laughs> is that you banging around there, Chris? No, that was me. Oh, okay. Well, then Katrina's making some eggs. Bring enough for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that noise too, but no, it's not me, unfortunately. Weird. That's really weird. <laughs> and so uh, definitely not on our end, but who knows? We, we, we work in a haunted radio station here, so you never know what could happen. Uh, so, we're equal. <laughs> <laughs> so we are going to take a break uh, for the news right now. Uh, when we come back on the other side, we'll get more in-depth in the conversation with our guest, Katrina Jane. You can check out her website while we are in the news break if you would like to. Katrina-Jane.com. It's linked up on SpookySouthCoast.com. We've been sharing the links on social media at SpookySC if you want to find us on Spooky South Coast. And you can find her at KJ Clairvoyant. And we'll talk about clairvoyancy coming up in the next hour, what that means and, and how her gift works for her. And we'll find out more about Indigo and Crystal Children. And we'll find out how that could relate to the children in your life as well. So stay tuned for all of that coming up. Again, a reminder that we do have the Legend Trips event coming up on May 21st at Edaville. It's for sale right now. If you go to legendtrips.com, you can click on the event page and get your tickets. I've had four people already message me since we started the show saying that they are buying their Edaville tickets either tomorrow or Monday. So I'm telling you, this event is selling like crazy. You don't want to miss out on your chance. So please go to legendtrips.com to be able to do that. And remember to sign up for the message uh, for the mailing list so that when we do announce that next much more, much more smaller, much more intimate, and I believe this location is the first time anybody's ever investigated it as well, make sure that you sign up so that you can get access to that as well. All right, we'll be back in a bit with some more. New Bedford's News Talk Station. New Bedford's News Talk Station. 1420 WBSM. New Bedford. Streaming worldwide on Radio Pop and on WBSM.com. New Bedford's News Talk 
Station, New Bedford's News Talk Station, 1420 WBSM. New Bedford, streaming worldwide on Radio Pop and on WBSM.com. Welcome back. Hour number two of Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here, along with science advisor Matt Moniz. Silent assassin is on his way home. On his way, going to sleep. Don't blame him. He's hey, he's got to get up earlier than all of us tomorrow. So, it's uh, you know, people don't realize like he he's all over the place. He does a lot of things. He's so quiet about it, but you know he's always always hustling that silent assassin. So it was great having him last week here for the whole show. It was like old times. It was just him and I. It was like, this is how it used to be when we didn't really know what we were talking about, you know, <laughs> before, we, before we brought Moniz on board. And, and he finally wised us up a little bit. So uh, we are also welcoming in our co-host for the night. The spoo- well, he's pretty much our co-host all the time. He doesn't always talk on the air, but he's always involved in the show as it's going on. And, of course, in everything that it has, everything to do with Spooky South Coast, uh, during the week as well, Chris Balzano is co-hosting, and our guest tonight, joining us all the way from Australia, is a clairvoyant medium. Her name is Katrina Jane, and Katrina, what does that exactly mean for somebody for somebody to be clairvoyant? Oh, let me. Well, my my on. version of it, my meaning of it, a clairvoyant is someone who can see things that are going to happen to someone, can under you know pick people's um, personalities of family members. Yeah, all of that sort of thing. So it does – look, I always say to people when I'm doing readings for them, when you get a, a reading and there's all these future predictions, oh, this can happen and that can happen, it, it doesn't have to happen. You can choose not to go that path. So that's when people sort of go, oh, but why don't you know the lotto numbers or something? You know, And you go, right. well, you're not supposed to know the lotto numbers. We don't know that kind of detail. It's a very much it's an en- exchange of energies. So it- – one of the questions that I always have for people with mediumship abilities is, you know, you're saying that being a clairvoyant, you see things that are going to happen to them. Is that the same way it happens to you when using your mediumship abilities, that you see the people, uh, the, the loved ones who are coming back to try to visit? It's not the same for me every time. Sometimes I can quite vividly see a person, and sometimes it's just the energy of them. Like sometimes I just go, no, it's a female, and she's. I feel that she was old when she passed away. Or she – it's like I did a reading for a lovely lady – and, you know, when, when they sit down in my rooms and I, I do my little you know, chat about it, how it all works, before they ask any questions, I just said to this particular lady, there's, there's a male in the spirit world, but he's not old. He's around your age and he's just very strongly coming through. That's all I got. And she just said that would be my brother. Hmm. So I don't necessarily go, hey, it's Phil. I'm her brother. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> da, 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 da. It's, unfortunately, it's not quite that black and white. So then in, in uh, you know, being clairvoyant and, and having these visions and, and sometimes seeing these, these spirits that are coming back, how do you determine then between what is a vision and what is the reality of the moment? Sometimes you can't, to be honest. Hmm. Sometimes you just can't because you'll just get something and I'll go, okay, this is what I'm getting. Uh, you know, it's X, Y, Z. Does that make sense to you? Like, has this, you know, well, I'm just trying to think of an example. I did a reading this week for a lady and I said, look, around your workplace, there's this big change that's coming up. You know, you're going to be given more more work to do. Or, and, and I went into all this detail and I said, I feel this is coming up. She goes, no, it's happening right now. I went, okay. Hmm. So you don't always get that. If it's not making sense to them, I'll go, this is definitely a future thing. But sometimes when it's close to just about to happen, sort of happening, it's a bit of a blurred line. Because when it's happening and you're getting the information, you're getting the vision, you don't have any kind of judgment of time. You know, you don't know, no. what, you know when the difference is between then and when it'll happen. That's right. And and the thing, too, is it's the person's perception of time. And to give you a, a really funny story, there was this woman who was just so, you know, those people that just sit there with their arms folded and they don't want to hear a word of what you're saying. And you're sitting there going, I'm wondering why you actually paid to come and see me right, if you're not yeah. open to whatever I'm giving you. And I said to her, 
there was this relationship in the past that, that that's happened and it's really, really, you know, shattered you. And, you know, I went into this and she's like, no, 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 no. And at the end of it, she goes, I'm so disappointed in this. And I went, well, why? And she goes, well, you didn't talk about my relationship. I said, what relationship? She went, the one that ended six months ago. And I went, you, you don't think <laughs> that was the one in the past. But for her, it was still real and raw, <laughs> you know. Like, so mm. even though the relationship had ended six months ago, she yeah. wasn't open to understanding that that was actually the past. And, and, and you mentioned, you know, that, uh, that your mother refers to what you do as being a counselor. And, and we kind of joked about that a little bit. But you have to have a sensibility in what you do of how to help people process the information that you're giving them. You know, you can't just dump all this stuff in their lap and then say, all right, go do what you want with that. You have to kind of give them some idea of how to process that information. Absolutely. Absolutely. You do. And you are very much a counsellor. I've had plenty of people that have come in to see me and have cried because their relationship is ending or, you know, for whatever reason, at the end of it said, oh, thank you. I just thought you'd be cheaper than a psychologist. (laughs) (laughs) They They do because it's someone they can talk to who can give them a different perspective on things. And who's not attached, you know, sometimes like you want to sit and talk to your friends, but they've got their opinions of your partner or they've, so they like to speak to someone who doesn't know. I, you know, I've been saying for a long time now that, you know, the HMOs, the insurance companies here, at least in the United States, they should start covering mediums and psychics because their, their rates are a lot cheaper than the psychologists. So you Absolutely. would save, you'd save money. And they also have a, a longer uh, standing in like history, but. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, very <laughs> much so. They go a little bit further past Sigmund Freud. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and in some cases, more accurate. <laughs> I don't know, there was no Freud references in the Bible. Uh, but no, uh, when, when, so now this is, this is what you go through on a, on a daily basis. So it's being able to kind of help these people uh, accept this information and work it into their lives. When you are... You know, how how do you then take any of the, or do you not get visions that have anything to do with your your own life and your own path? Do, do you ever get anything that relates to you? And then if you do, how do you process that? No, I don't. I and I almost I wouldn't. I think for me, it would be like a doctor trying to di- diagnose themselves, you know, or fraud, you know, fraudian slip, or you know, trying to analyze yourself. You're too close to the situation mm-hmm. to actually give an impartial understanding of what you're getting. Oh, I totally understand that. Uh, so now putting all this together and, and of course, uh, now focusing this on children and with the new book, Do You See What I See? You're trying to help children understand what these what these abilities are and, and that uh, when this stuff does happen to them, when you are dealing with a child that has this happen, what, what would you tell a child? If I came to you right now and said, you know, my child is, is having these, these weird visions and I think that they have some sort of, you know, actual clairvoyancy to them how do you process not what you would tell me as the parent but what would you say to the Hmm. child what would i say to the child i would sit down with them and talk to them about it not not judgment not not saying is it scary don't put any i wouldn't put any thoughts into their their minds so i'd sit down and go so what are you actually seeing you know are you seeing a man or a woman or a child or a little you know little girl little boy getting them to open up about and and trying to explain more about what they're seeing and then I would be going and how does that make you feel like you know are you scared or does it not bother you do you mean and so sort of sort of trying to get them to sort of understand that it's okay with what they're seeing and then if they feel a little bit you know um intimidated by it or it makes them a little bit scared and then they're scared to go to sleep because this person's at the end of their bed for instance I would then tell them that they've got the power they've got the ability within themselves to tell that person that that goes to go away that, you know, and, and, it's, and it's a bit, you know, in any instance of giving a child the strength to go, you can say this, it's all right, and it, they will listen to you. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of the, the problem is that, you know, especially at a young age, if this happens to you, there, there's a loss of control and there's a loss of kind of, you know, having a handle on the situation when somebody just shows up that you think shouldn't be there. Hmm. But that doesn't mean that you're out of control of your life. You know, that doesn't mean that you can't ask them to go away just like you would a a living, breathing person. That's right. And that's what I think is very important for these children to understand that they are allowed to do that. They don't have to have that that spirit in their rooms if they don't want to. And then now when you're telling them this, uh, what's the usual reaction that you hear from them? I mean, is it is it one of 
uh, are they afraid to have found out that they have this ability, or does it become more of an understanding and, and more almost of a relaxation now that they, they have an understanding of what it is? It's mainly a relaxation because for them, even though it might be a little bit weird, when they talk to someone who understands what's going on, they're just like, oh, okay, that's cool. They, they, it doesn't bother them in the slightest. And most often with children, you'll find, you know, the majority of the time, it's actually a loved one of the family. Like it might have been a grandparent that they might never have met or something like that. And I will sometimes sit there and go to them, you know, was it, was it a, you know, if they say, oh, it was, it's a man, I go, okay. And I say to the parents, give me a photo album with some of your, your family members. And more often than not, the kids will go, oh, that's him. That's who it was. Uh-oh. You know, one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that I was thinking about, you know, just right now as you were talking in earlier, and maybe I've got the, the negative side of it on my, in, my, in my brain so much, is that one thing you were talking about, the control of you being able to shut it off and not shut it off. And I understand from both what you were saying and from the book itself, this idea of um, that it's not okay or that it's, it's, I don't want to talk to you right now. But do you think there's a danger in allowing kids to open themselves up psychically, whether it be, A, for... Um, you know, their inability to have that kind of control the way an adult might and be to, for letting something negative in, you know, for, for those of us who have, have worked, um, sometimes the darker things, uh, have a Mm. tendency to hide themselves as people we know, or people we did know or love or, or people who might be very trust trusting when you first see them and then it opens it up. And, and I'm wondering if there's a danger in teaching, um, children about their own psychic ability in either of those ways. I don't think there is, as long as there is that, you, you, you're giving them that understanding that they do have that ability. Do you mean like that they can turn it off? Yeah, that's or, one part and of it. Just, yeah. that's, that's, that's a big thing to say to them. If you don't want it, just say so. They have to listen to you. You know, and I've always said to children too is that if they're not listening to you, talk to mummy and daddy about it. And then, you know, mm-hmm. if necessary, you go and get a house clearing or something. Do you mean, like, if, if it's becoming something that's more negative, that's that's not um, doing what it's told? Right. Or even you know, just being overwhelmed, like you were talking about yeah. how when, you, when, you, when you're off of your work mindset and you want to go back to just being you, you have the ability to shut it off. But they might not have the ability to do that as well as an adult does. That's right. And, again, it's teaching them. Okay, if it's nighttime, you just say to them, go away, I want to sleep. And you're actually teaching them that that concept of go go away. I don't want. I'm going to school now. I don't want to see you. Or right. go away. I'm you know doing the shopping and I don't want to get bugged. So you're actually giving them the, the the power within themselves to turn it on and off. And, and, and how I'll about that? Them, how about you know, that hiding ability that that darker spirits seem to have? And, I, and of course, we've all heard tons of stories about you know the the whatever happened in the house began with the the, the spirit making contact with the child. Absolutely, because you know, the children it. are most susceptible and open to that sort of thing. Right. In that instance, seriously, the, the kids aren't really going to understand that. And I would be saying to the parents, keep an eye on them. If you notice their behaviour is changing or things are starting to happen, then you've got to step in and you get someone else in to help. So uh, what, one of the things that I would be concerned about if I was a parent and, and my child was having this ability is how to determine that it is an ability and not some kind of other affliction. How do you know that they're actually communicating with somebody on the other side or, or having you know clairvoyant visions and not having some sort of a, a breakdown or a schizophrenic episode? How is there a way that you can help them make that determination? I, I again, like I said, the for, for children, the majority are it's a, it's a loved one, so usually they can point the picture and go, yeah, that's who it is. Mm. And so you sort of sit there and go, okay, well, there's a bit of proof there that they're not just making this up, that they're not, you know, they're, they're in uh, hormones or their, you know, chemical reactions in their brain are, are doing weird things. It they was you they will usually give you some kind of proof, you know, it, no different to like we're saying reincarnation. They'll start talking about things, and more likely you can sort of look it up and go, oh my goodness, you know, like I said, so many parents have, have emailed me going. And I've said, look, I think it's their grandmother or it's their grandfather or it's whoever. And they'll go, oh, my goodness, you were so right. They actually described what they were wearing and that was what my dad was wearing the day that he died. You know, like there's that sort of proof that the child couldn't possibly know that, which then makes it real. Is there a a point where it can become, I don't want to say dangerous, well, maybe dangerous, but is there a point where it can become uh, too much to have your child dwell into this. I mean, do they? How do you make sure that they keep a, a firm foothold in, 
you know, life without the ability and also still being able to incorporate that into their life, if you get what I mean. Yeah, I, I do. So I could, you could probably say to them, so if any parents out there would, would give to children like this, is say to them, okay, that's playtime. Okay, you've got to tell your friends to go away now because it's now time to sit down with the family. You know, again, you're giving that turn off, turn off, turn on kind of uh, mechanism to the children. And, and the other thing I always say, I'll just say this one as well, that for the, as the majority of people that come through from the spirit world to children are relatives or loved ones, they're not going to turn around and tell your child to do dangerous things because that spirit loves that child. That's why they're visiting them. So, you know, if your child is there going, oh, you know, the spirit told me to get the knife out of the drawer and stab the cat, you know, that that's not a good thing. And that's – I would be looking into getting your house cleared or, you know, again, getting your child checked for any problems. Well, we are talking with Katrina Jane. She's our guest tonight. If you have any questions, you can call in at 508-996-0500-877-996-1420. You can also text them to us at 67664. Just start your text with the letters WBSM. And you can also uh, post them up on Twitter. You can either send them directly to us at SpookySC, or you can use the hashtag SpookyLive. Uh, so... Now, Katrina, these you, you mentioned in the synopsis of the book and you discuss in the book the idea of indigo and crystal children. And, and for those who are unfamiliar, how would you describe those? They are those children that, um, what's the easiest way to explain it? They are those children that you know, can see spirit. They can see more. And, and they are also predictive of things as well like they can say oh you can't go on that plane because you know something's going to happen there it, it's more than just you know a talented child with music it, it is um, a very and they're usually very sensitive children they are like emotionally they are you're normally very sensitive well is there a difference in 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 what is an indigo and what is a crystal you know what? I wouldn't. I I try not to get too much too caught up into all different levels of descriptive things. I try and always keep everything as simple as possible. And to me, I would say they're pretty much the same. It's just that your interpretation of it. Because that's really all that that that's all that that differentiation is. Really, it's just a level mm. of how attuned they are. Yeah, that's right. And you know, it's. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 that's all right. No, no, I was just going to say, it, it is. It's, it's not like as we are talking about earlier, you know, the Bible. It's just your interpretation of what their, their abilities and gifts are. But these, uh, I mean, for some reason, though, we're seeing an influx of these type of children, or at least it seems that way. Maybe it's because we finally put a label on it and paid attention to it. But it seems like over the last decade or so, we've had an, an influx of, of indigo children, of crystal children, where, you know, we, we wouldn't have heard about this so frequently in years past. Was that just our own uneducation on it? Or is it something that really is part of a, a growing trend? I, I would say it's a mixture of both, to be honest. I think it is a bit of a growing trend. But I think, secondly, we have things like the Internet now. We, we are more open to listening and hearing what's going on in the entire world as opposed to, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago when you only got your local newspaper and people didn't talk about it. And I think people are becoming more open about these abilities that, that people have and that children have. So, I mean, I would think that this book then, if you're helping them with – dealing with the discovery of these abilities and, and helping them with how to put that in perspective in their life, it could almost kind of be an allegory for other things that are going on with kids as well, for the other changes that are going to come in their lives and some of the other challenges and some of the other, you know, scary things that they don't understand that they're going to have to face. Absolutely. It absolutely is because, you know, I think that the main thing is I keep sort of, I suppose, reiterating is the fact that you're giving the children the power to take control of what's happening to them. Well, they have the right to say no. They have the right to say go away. Is there, though, uh, the when, – when they are kind of realizing that they have this power, I mean, you have to also be careful that you are making sure that they keep it under control. You know, don't, don't become uh, megalomaniacal about it. Don't, you know, don't, don't think yeah. that you're going to – you know, you have to have them understand that they have to keep this in perspective and that they, they can't – run around kind of, uh, you know, acting superior or, or flaunting it in anybody's face either. You'd find that most kids wouldn't. When they're that young, they wouldn't unless the parents start 
teaching them that way. You know, the t- parents start putting them on the pedestal. And, you know, I say to people, don't treat your child like a performing monkey. They're not. Don't go when the family have to go, go, oh, come watch them do this. They're going to tell you your future. Like, don't do that. Don't, don't make it some like there's some kind of freak show. You know, explain to them that, you know, they have this ability. There are lots of other people out there that have the ability. Maybe nobody else in the family does. Some people will understand it and some people won't. I mean, it, it, uh, I could just envision a scenario where maybe a kid's getting picked on by a bully and, uh, and you know, the, the kid has these abilities to see into the future and just turns to the bully and say, well, you know, have fun picking on me now because you're going to be flipping fries and burgers at McDonald's 20 years from now. Yeah. And, it, and the only difference is they're not just making a joke. They actually know. That's right. But then the person who's receiving it doesn't know that it's not a joke. <laughs> You know, it's it's things are rolling around in my mind as an educator. And I'm just wondering whether, uh, you know, if you've worked with children who have who have developed these abilities, um, do they find themselves to be um, more or less alienated in school? And, and and how does it impact their education? Maybe this is boring for anyone else other than me, but I'm totally interested in that. You would find that most kids probably won't talk about it. They they when they're really young, because you know, children don't differentiate. They don't care. They don't have that self, um, you know, self awareness that, that we do as we get older. But when they start realizing that other kids can't see what they're seeing, they will usually shut it down. And so that's right. why you. Yeah, again, I have a lot of people coming through and go, "I used to see this as a kid, but oh, then it got a little bit weird, and and no one else saw it, and so I, I, I just turned it off and I got it to go away. But can I open it up again now? So you actually find that they usually won't because they don't want to be the odd one. Right. They don't want to be How that about freak. the. How about the children that you've worked with? I mean, do they, do they, how do they do in school, like academically and socially? They do perfectly fine academically because, again, you know, they're not, they've got no. I'm not uh, saying they're getting the answers from the other side. Yeah, yeah, they're not, they're not getting more any, of any, like, any, I'm, they, they, I'm they, thinking they more of the normal. opening up of their mind. Does it make them think differently as they approach their studies or, you know, is this something right. that can actually even help us in business or whatever? I think it can, it does help them because they're, they're more, open to everything that's going around them like I said they're usually more sensitive they're more emotionally clicked on to people and and they can sent like sense things that others can't and so you know techniques that you can give to these kids always you know, things like meditation and things like that to clear their minds you know so they're not getting messages well that helps to you know calm you down before your exams right right they can do that sort of thing because they've got that ability to turn off turn on and and deal with what's coming through they, I just feel they have a greater awareness. So, but at the same time, they do can they they do feel a bit odd, and that's why I said a lot right. of times they just won't won't tell people because they don't want to be that odd one. But it doesn't affect their studies in the answer to that actual question. No, they they don't um, don't let it affect their studies okay. unless they are highly highly emotive. Like if they're very like very much an empath and they can they people. You know, all the stress of a room when they're sitting down, say, to do an exam can overwhelm them. It's Again, it's about giving them the techniques to learn how to not let that happen. Right, right. Is there an advantage, though, to, uh, you know, you know if, you, if you are discovering this at a younger age and you are going through this process and, 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 and trying to come to grips with what's happening and understanding it, is there an advantage then if it happens to you later in life, if you make this discovery later in life and, and you can apply your lifetime experience to it? Or do you find that it's actually harder to deal with, uh, you know, an adult or maybe like a teenager who is just discovering this for the first time because they're not as malleable as the mind of a child may be? Absolutely. And again, kids, little ones don't always completely understand what's going on and Try, like I said, trying to teach them, you know, the techniques and things to do can be a little bit difficult for them. Whereas an adult, you can see they go, this is what you need to do. They'll go, okay, then. Well, and they can deal with it. They have a more open, not more open mind because children have an open mind, but the, like you said, the life experience that an adult or a teenager almost has compared to, say, a three-year-old which, is hugely different. But a ch- three-year-old will just go, yeah, this is the way it is, you know. That's right, it. exactly. I mean, you can teach higher concepts to an adult kind of right off the bat, but with a, a child, it's probably easier to get them to accept that this is this is your normal. And yes. because they don't know what their normal is yet, they haven't developed that. So you can kind of include that at a young age, and it will probably make them much more gifted, you know, uh, clairvoyance, much more gifted people when they're when they're older. Yes. Yeah, I would agree with that. 
it, now you said that you've only really been dealing with this publicly yourself for, for a little while now, but have you seen any of these children that you worked with early on and, and how much they've been able to develop over time? Not a lot. I, I have, I have helped a lot of little ones, so they're but still, again, still pretty young. They're, st- they're still pretty young and it's about them accepting it and, and dealing with it because they still haven't quite got to that point of, do I really want to keep doing this or not? They just accept that's just what's happening in their lives. And, and I find that, you know, the people that I deal with that have kids that, that they feel have some sort of drawing toward this. You know, I, we investigate for ghosts and we run a, a company where people go out and look for ghosts with us in historic places. So a lot of times I'll have people that come up to me and say, you know, you know, my, my kid is very aware of the fact that there are ghosts around. And then I'll say to them, well, you know, maybe they have abilities. Maybe that's something they could pursue. And they don't mm. want to look at it from that perspective. You know, they, they don't want to get into that side of it. They're still trying to keep it at a, at, a, at a, you know, almost like there's a line between the kid and the spirit to say, oh, no, no, he, he doesn't perceive it that way. He just knows that they're there. If you get what I mean, they don't want to yeah. actually put their child in connection with it. They'd rather have their child, you know, hunt for it, but they don't want to actually have it meet it, if, you, if, if that yes. makes sense. Yeah, but they want to draw that line in the sand of, of it's, it's over there and there's no label on them that they're psychic or, again, a bit freaky, that they can do that, mm. you know. And, again, that, that's the – again, as I said earlier, it's like the parents put those things and fears and all that sort of stuff onto the child. It's like a child doesn't know how to be racist. Right, exactly, yeah. And, but also, you know, when you bring a kid to the zoo, you know, you understand that there's a, a fence between the lion and your child. Mm. And when you're dealing with something that you, you know, as a parent, you can't see or understand. I'm sure it's different when the parents also have abilities too, but if the parents haven't developed it and they don't understand it, you know, it's going to be a lot harder for them to accept that it could be happening to their kid as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And like I said, they'll just put that fear onto the child. It seems like you need to have another book that talks about how parents should talk to their kids mm-hmm. about. Yeah. <laughs> Good <laughs> idea. I will, I'll make a note of that one. <laughs> well, and uh, I, I feel too that, uh, you know, just as we say, and, and Chris, Chris and I were kind of discussing this a little bit offline. He said that you guys were discussing this as well. You know, I feel that when kids come out to us with, with us and do investigations and, and actually look for ghosts, it helps them kind of understand what comes after this life. And I, I can only imagine that being able to be in communication with it helps them understand even more. Absolutely. There's not that fear of, of well, like I said, no one really want, nobody wants to die, but there's not that fear of death because you know there's something else. And you have a greater understanding and acceptance of things. So, I mean, would you recommend that this book be read by somebody who, you know, is going through that in their life, even even if they don't have abilities themselves, but just to kind of comfort them in knowing that, you know, loved ones can still be communicated with? Oh, absolutely. Well, I've actually just written an, another book about death for children. It's about to be released uh, either this week or next week. I think it's next week. It's entitled Where Did They Go? And we... I wrote it specifically because my husband was playing golf with his mate and he came home from golf and he was really upset. And I said, like, what's going on? And he goes, oh, Bruce, his mate, nephew is is dying. He's literally, you know, going to go today or tomorrow. And he has a four-year-old and a two-year-old. And the parents and, you know, the the workers and all that were trying to explain to the four-year-old what was going on because, you know, how do you explain death to a child? And they were saying, Daddy's going into the sky. And so the four-year-old comes back with, well, if Daddy's in the sky, why can't we just catch a plane and go up and see him? You know, and so that's, that's another book that I've written. And it explains death and about how, you know, um, once we've passed over, we can come back and, you know, you might still see your Daddy or, you know, you might get a message like feathers, you know, and all those sorts of things. But it's opened up. It's not that religious, oh, you die and go to heaven. Mm-hmm. It's more about the spirit world and, and how you can they can still be around you, again, to give that sort of comfort that even though you might not necessarily see them, they will always be around you. Well, that's what I was wondering is if you, if you have this approach and you have this, this great belief about, um, about, you know, children should nurture their psychic ability, do you teach death without that, um, without that clairvoyant aspect to it? So, or do you believe that all kids have that and so the two things should go together 
I don't think all children have clairvoyant abilities. We're, we're all different. We all have different levels of it. I, I believe we all sort of can sometimes have it, but not all children are open to it. So it, it's it's about if you have a child, it's not always going to be a clairvoyant kind of thing because they might not actually see. But it's, I think in a way you could explain it to them that if someone they love has passed away, or whether it's a pet, whether it's you know a parent or a grandparent or a friend, that they they can come back and and not to be scared about that. But do you? I'm wondering if there's a way to communicate and to connect with them about death without necessarily um, telling them that that people come back. You know, I, I'm because you know it, it's it's um, it can be if if especially if this person hasn't experienced it. The idea that someone can come back and it's not part of their life can be kind of intimidating. Um, oh, absolutely. And I suppose if that was the case, it's more of that religious thing that they die and go to heaven. Right, right. Well, we, we actually, you know, a, it's. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, no, no, you're right. You go ahead. I was going to say, we have a question that came in via the text line about past lives, and, and you can text into the show at 67664. Just be sure to start it with the letters WBSM. And the question is so, based on experience, how far back do past lives go, and when did they start? They go back to day dot, almost as far as I'm concerned, because you do. You have people that can um, – there there's a book. I don't know if you guys have read it, Many Lives, Many Masters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was actually a psychiatrist who you know, ended up putting this person through hypnosis and actually found that you know, they, their lives went back you know, thousands of years almost. And it, it is. We, we can go back to – who knows, you know, to Atlantic, Atlantis, if you like. But everyone's different as to how far they go back. Some are new souls and some, some are very old souls. Have you gotten any insight as to why that is? Why, I mean, why some people are more connected to past lives or have more past lives while others haven't? Well, we could be really funny and say they just haven't learned their lessons, so they've just got to keep coming back. <laughs> <laughs> right. But that, that, I mean, I'm sure that's some degree of truth to that, though, too. Yeah, there would be because, I mean, I do believe for my, my um, beliefs of reincarnation are, you know, we come back, we come to this world, we have lessons we need to learn. If we don't learn them, we've got to come back and do it all over again. It could be in a different, you know, obviously a different body in a different situation, but we'll still face the same things. And until you learn those things, you're not ready to move to the next next life. Well, I'm, I'm, I can tell you, i got a lot to learn still now <laughs> in this one. But, I mean, I, I also feel, too, like uh, when... You can uh, past lives is something that I didn't really buy into a lot when we first started doing the show, but I've come over the years. I've, I've come to a kind of an understanding that sometimes you just can't deny that it's it's the case. And uh, for me, it it didn't make any sense that you would want to keep kind of going back and and trying to repeat these things. But then I realized, like anything that you want to get good at, repetition is the key. And any, you know, when you want to learn to play an instrument, you have to keep practicing every day. So if, if every life is just practice toward getting better, I have to wonder, you know, when, when do you reach that perfect level? Is there a perfect level that you can reach? I think there is. And again, you know, some people get really caught up and there's like, you know, 12 levels of heaven or something like that that we've all got to work our way through. But I also feel, again, this is my interpretation of reincarnation, that we all have to experience everything that a life can offer. So, you know, some of us will come back as murderers and others will be murdered or rapists and, and, and being raped or, you know, losing a child or having 10 children. And you can't fit all of those things into one life. And until we've experienced all of those things, we can't sort of go to that next level of, you know, whether you want to call it as being an angel or, or whatever. We can still just be those spirit guides in between our lives and our reincarnation. But it's like getting to that next level going, OK, I've, I've learned it all now. That's it. I don't have to come back again. Right, and I remember um, reading the a book, I believe it was called The Broken Road, which is about um, West African culture, and it wasn't necessarily about you need to learn your lessons, but to make your soul complete, you need to experience different things. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, and so people were given the choice at any given time during after they passed of going back because they needed to um, not learn a lesson, but because they needed to experience something. And I remember... So you know, in that book in particular, it's about the, the person need to learn about suffering and, and starvation and things like that mm. because they, they felt that would complete their soul. Yeah, and that's right. You know, and you can't go through that and then be like a wealthy businessman in New York 
as well as being a mother who's had a miscarriage. Who You know, like there, there is just so many things that we need to experience and go through. You just can't fit it into one lifetime. But if we are going to go through multiple lifetimes and we are going to go through these experiences, why do we have that? Why, why can't we have full recollection of what we've been through? Why do we have to, to keep it isolated to that particular lifetime? I think it's to, to fully understand to go through something, you've never had to experience anything like it before. And I think it's that whole, you know, going cold turkey. Some children do. You'll find that some children do actually, as we've spoken, you know, do remember even their, their previous previous lives. But for me, it's almost like a bit of an unfair advantage if we already know about it. But for instance, and this, I think the thing is for us as humans, because we are like spirits in a human body and we think like humans, it's hard to grasp that spirit thought process. And I've had people who've gone, no, I don't believe in reincarnation. Why would my mother have chosen to come and die of cancer? She wouldn't have done that. And you go, well, yeah, she did. And, you know, we're up there in the spirit world and, you know, they all get together, so to speak, and one will go, well, I've never experienced the loss of a child. I've, I've never lost a child at birth. And someone will go, you know, another spirit will go, well, I haven't actually died at birth, so I'll be that child. Hmm. And so it's all preordained and predestined. And, and to me, that's how it all happens. They've gone, no, no, it's all. And once we've passed over, we go back into that spirit world. And we go, ah, oh, damn it, I didn't do that right. And I didn't do that right. Crap, now I've got to come back and do it again. And others go, no, it's all cold. It's, it's all happened the way it was meant to happen. So basically, and, and this might be a lost reference on, on somebody from Australia, but you're basically saying our existence is one big choose-your-own-adventure book. Absolutely. I, I would say that. Where, you know, so what, you have do, I, what have I got to do next? <laughs> if you didn't like what happened when you turned to page 41, just go back to page 14 and see what happened if you went to 38 instead. That's it. That's it. You, you, that's what you're doing. All right, well, we have a call coming in here, and I just want to stress uh, for those who do want to call in at 508 508- Nine nine six zero five hundred or eight seven seven nine nine six fourteen twenty. Although Katrina Jane is a clairvoyant medium, uh, she's not doing any readings tonight. We, if you have a question for her, you can call in with a question. And if you want to get a reading from her, you can go to katrinajane.com, <laughs> katrina-jane.com, and book a reading right there. The, all the information of when you can get it and how to book it is all right there on the front page of her site. So hopefully, this person has a question for you. Good evening. You're on Spooky South Coast. How are you? Hi, um, I was just wondering, could you please explain the difference to me between a spirit and an entity? Were you able to hear the question? Can you ask the question one more time for them? Uh, No, I can't hear anything. Sorry, I couldn't hear it. Hang on, we're going to have her ask it one more time. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes. Could you please explain the difference between a spirit... No, it's cutting in and out. Okay, she... She was asking for the difference between a spirit and an entity. That is correct. Yeah, okay. That's fine. Um, a spirit to me is, is, as I said previously, it's like a loved one. So it's someone that, that cares about us, who, you know, wants, is, is around us to help us in some way, offer guidance and just sort of try and push us in the right way, overplaying our lives. An entity is stuck in, hasn't properly passed over, but they don't have a good vibe about them. They're not very beneficial to you. They are still sort of caught in their own, their own selves and, and they don't want anybody else to be happy either. All right. Well, thank you for the call. We seem to be having a little bit of uh, some technical issues here, but thank you very much for the call. Thank you. Have a good night. I don't know uh, what's exactly going on here, but it's like, you you know, as soon as we start bringing in the callers and and things start kind of bouncing around a little bit, I'd like to think that, (laughs) you know, it's it's something from the others. Yeah, that's and I can tell you, we have had this studio blessed by a demonologist. We've had we've had that happen more than once. Yes. And it might be time to renew our our cleansing here. We certainly have enough stuff that happens. Actually, we have a demonologist joining us next week. So maybe you know. we need to uh, to come back in our next life. Yeah, we lost you there, Chris. I was going to say maybe in our next life we need to uh, fix this. Uh, <laughs> there it goes. The audio problems. Yeah, that's, that's what we need to work out to to get to Nirvana. 
We're we're really losing you guys now quite a bit. <laughs> so uh, we'll see if uh, maybe shutting off a couple of these buttons will help out. Any. Yeah. Because everything was going so great before. Yep. Everything it just it was. started to go to hell once I started pressing other buttons. Couldn't possibly have been me. So yeah, you guys are both cutting in and out still. Yeah, not at all. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yes, I am. All right, I, I think we're we're losing the connection here. Uh, I'm not surprised. This kind of stuff does happen, as you know, we, the the night gets later and the internet speeds drop down and all that. Uh, so Katrina Jane, we will ask you just to let everybody know uh, how they can get a hold of you if they do want to reach out and and book a reading with you, and if they want to find out more about you. <laughs> I think we're losing. Them Absolutely. Completely. If anyone would like to have a reading, I do emailed readings. I do everything online. Can you hear me? I do oh, yeah. everything online and just go to my website, <laughs> katrina-jane.com. All right. And, uh, and of course, uh, we'll keep our eyes peeled for the, for the new book that you said is coming uh, very shortly. But for now, all your other books are available through your website, including a, the, you can download a free ebook, How to Know If You're Psychic, just by going to the website. That's it. You saw Ken. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us. We were having a great discussion, and I'm sorry that the connection is cutting out a little bit. We'll uh, we'll have you to cut bring... out, but thank you. Yep. We'll have to bring you over here sometime and do it in studio. <laughs> or That's can... okay. You keep cutting out. But thank you so much, guys. It was lovely chatting with you. Likewise. Thank you so much. And thank Chris... you. Chris, thank you as well. Chris, Chris is like, I already gave up on these guys. All right. Well, that I mean, unfortunately, that's the the kind of thing that happens is you know sometimes because uh, you're connecting over the internet, you have to connect over the internet if you want to reach out to the other side of the world, and so sometimes you do get the calls that'll drop down and the internet speeds will drop down. But I was really enjoying the conversation. I thought we were having a great time, and uh, hopefully we can uh, pick it up again sometime. This we'll try to work it out. We can bring her on during one of those prime time shows. It might be a little bit earlier in the morning for her, but we know we'll have a. A stronger connection. Uh, she was definitely a good guest. I enjoyed, you know, listening to her. She definitely is knowledgeable. And and as we always discuss when we are talking about abilities, we, we always ask the person who is our guest that has the abilities, you know, how it works for them. We never really take into account. We we ask the story of you know how did you first discover it, and you know more often than not, it happened to them when they were children. But we never really process exactly what must be going through their minds as children to have to go through this. And more often than not, when we're talking to these people, they've had to go through it alone and they've had to kind of figure it out for themselves. And now, you know, with this book, do you see what I see that Katrina Jane has written? They can use that. Children can get that book and use it. You know, I could envision this being in the library of a school and a kid can happen upon it and say, finally, here's something that will help me with what I'm going through and then I'll have an idea of what it is when I go to talk to my parents about it or when I talk to, you know, my psychiatrist or something about it or the school counselor. They'll have an idea of what it is. And, and one of the things that I, th I thought we touched upon a little bit there, and, and she said she was looking and working in the future, is now how do the adults take that information and process that? Because if a kid comes to you and tells you, Mom, I, I think I might have psychic or mediumship abilities, how does the mother not just say, oh, you know, you're just imagining it? You know, the, the mother has to be able to deal with that information as well. Or you get a parent that had the abilities, I guess, as a children, and then they're looking back, filtered through adult eyes. How do you explain, you know, what you felt as a child now as an adult? Because you're... Your viewpoint has now changed. And I wonder, you know, and as, you know, this book is relatively new, but as it's out there and, and people are utilizing it more, then how many adults are going to kind of reawaken that in themselves as well and go through this journey with their child? I mean, I think that that, that might be a, an added benefit of it, too, is that now you'll have parents that say, oh, OK, all right. I remember a lot of this before I shut it out. As you were saying, Moniz, you know, they remember what it felt like to do that. And then they say, well, then why? Do I have to abandon it? You know, why can't I go back into it? And you'll find that they'll kind of go out and, and seek the way to flex that muscle once again. Yeah. Uh, I mean, how many people back, I guess, in a day before stuff like this was openly talked about actually suppressed themselves 
I, according to what she's saying, this is something that, you know, happens in childhood and should be encouraged. And, you know, my beliefs on it may be different than other people, but if it's not harmful, why not? Well, one of the, uh, you know, one of the questions that, uh, you know, we'll call a non-paranormal person asked me recently was in talking about psychics and, and mediums, they said, well, how come everybody that has psychic and medium abilities has to try to get famous? You know, how come they have to put themselves out there and, and, and try to make money off readings and all that? And I, I, I had to explain. That's not, not true. Not all of them do. Yeah. Not Some all of, of them. Some of the best ones I've ever encountered didn't want that secret let out. Some of them don't even admit that it's happening to them. You know, look at Stephanie. For a long time, she refused to admit that that was the case. And, and I think that a lot of people that have these abilities live that way. I said the ones who, uh, this is kind of the way that I explained it to them, the ones who are out there in the public eye and charging and making money off of this are the ones who are drawn to that aspect of it. Just like some people like to just dress up in their house and pretend that they're somebody else, and then some people like to go and just do you know comic cons and, and cosplay as a character. Some people like to do community theater, and some people are drawn toward Broadway or or toward becoming a movie star. You know, it, it's all in where your level of taking your passion and your gift and your ability takes you. You know, some people are want to take it to the highest level they can. Some people just want to kind of, you know, have it be their own little thing that they do. And I think that that's what goes with a lot of this too. And and I think the ones who are out there and and are putting it out there, are also drawn to it because they can't not help other people, if you get what I mean. Like, they would almost feel like it would be... they become obligated, self-obligated. Yeah, because you're betraying this ability and betraying this gift because as most, you know, 90% of the people that we've interviewed about this have said, well, I can't really use it for myself. It doesn't work that way. I can't utilize it to kind of foresee my own path. That seems to be a common theme with a lot of the uh, people that say they're psychic, say, you know, I can't use this for myself. It, it doesn't, the, I guess the ability doesn't allow them to exploit it for their own purposes, I guess. I, yeah, I think that that, if that's, you know, it, then if that's the case and they're, they're drawn toward helping other people, it's because they have to use that gift. You know, the, right. it, it, it's, it's the urge to do it is so overwhelming. We'll see if we can still talk to Chris here. Chris, are you still there? Hello? Hi, can you hear us okay? I can hear you guys great. All right, so you were you you were cutting in and out though a little bit there too as well. Yeah, yeah, I could. I was having a hard time. I don't know. I don't know what it was <clears throat> that was causing it to happen. I felt bad that we had to cut things short, but we'll definitely bring Katrina Jane on again in the future. Yeah, because I mean we haven't touched upon past lives that much uh, on the show, at least that I know of, and so it was interesting to get that perspective. We we got literally like four straight weeks of the show, uh, you know, before the holidays. Like four straight weeks, a caller called in and was asking about it. And, you know, we discussed it kind of uh, pretty much in depth. Uh, and, it, and it showed me then, like, this is something that we really need to cover, you know, with, with more guests uh, coming forward. We've only really done it, like you said, a little bit. I can recommend a good book for people. Uh, Search for Bridie Murphy. That, that's another classic for, you know, past lives. And was it, uh, it was Richard Salva that we had on. Uh, talking about Lincoln and Lindbergh and and uh, and talking about past lives in the past. That's kind of when I started to change my mind is when, you know, I started looking into his work. So, I mean, I'm not still 100% convinced that, you know, I've had all these past lives. Maybe I'm new to this, but uh, I, I can certainly see where a lot of people it fits into their life narrative. So Earth is basically a remedial class for spirit. Maybe. Well, I, mean, I, I like that other idea of like not necessarily the lessons, but the experiences, you know, which would make this more of a uh, a battlefield or a playground for spirits. Yeah, kind of like I want to. I'm, I'm going to pretend I'm this this day. You know, like when my right. son, when my son was little and he would wear the same cowboy hat, and one day he'd be a cowboy, one day he'd be Indiana Jones, one day he'd be a police officer, but it's the same same hat each time. You know, it's maybe that's what we do. I don't know. If that's the case, if if uh, if we can have future lives, then I promise that in my next life I will be a guy who believes in past lives. So <laughs> should kind of all come about in a roundabout way. Well, uh, next week we'll be joined by James Anito. He is a demonologist uh, and a local demonologist. He's from Rhode Island. He'll be joining us in studio to talk about the field of demonology and his work in it. 
and uh, and really some of the uh, when we start discussing this, it always leads to the debate of you know what is a demon and what is just a, a bad ghost. So we're going to get into a lot of that as well, and I think we're going to have the opportunity next week to to really because he will be in studio with us. We can really get into some of the meat and potatoes of this. It, it might get a little spooky next week. It might get a little scary. I might need you guys to kind of follow me home and just make sure I get in the house okay. Like the old days. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I won't be doing that. But You um, you are exempt from that, Chris. You can just, you know, <laughs> you can message me to make sure that I made it home safe. But no, literally, not, not a lie, Chris. I used to, we used to all ride in together, and I would always want to get dropped off first because I'd be terrified after some of the topics we discussed on the show. Which is odd because I would imagine riding in the compressor would be more scary than anything that could happen to you. <laughs> it was. Oh my! <laughs> I'll never forget the night that we had to make it from Wareham to the Taps event uh, at at Mohe- at uh, Twin River. Uh, basically, what it should be like for a normal day, like an hour and five minute drive. Moniz got us there in fifteen minutes. <laughs> <laughs> fifteen minutes. I'm. I wish I was kidding. It was terrifying. When you have a supercharged Mercedes, speed is no no barrier. But I had my face buried in the seats in the back, uh, hoping that nothing bad happened. I said, you know, we're going to see the ghost hunters, not become, the Marce- not become ghosts ourselves. All right, well, that does it for this week's show. As I said, we will be back next week to talk more about the paranormal. And if you've missed any episodes, you can get them all from SpookySouthCoast.com or wherever podcasts are found. I know that iTunes uh, has uh, the, the, you know, the last 100 episodes up. They take a few days to update. Player.fm is a great site to get it as soon as it's posted. Within minutes of it being posted, you can stream it there. You can download it. The Stitcher app. They carry it. There's uh, really we're everywhere, literally everywhere podcasts are found. So and it's always free. So you definitely want to download some of the past episodes if you like the show. And of course, follow us all week long on Twitter at Spooky SC. And you can also email us Spooky Crew at SpookySouthCoast.com. And follow me personally at Tim Weisberg. When I get my ghost arc on Monday, I will do an unboxing periscope. And we can all, you know, kind of go through this together and see what happens. So that does it for this week's show. Until next week, for Matt, for Matt, for Chris, for Stephanie, I'm Tim. We want you all to stay spooky. New Bedford's News Talk Station. New Bedford's News Talk Station. 1420 WBSM. New Bedford. Streaming worldwide on Radio Pop. And on-